Hello everyone and welcome to JFG tonight or the public space. I think we should rename it the public space. Uh, we have, I'm seeing on social media, deers running out of forest that are on fire. We have some ocean water seeping onto the streets of Florida, lighting up the Teslas on fire. And today I am speaking directly to you, my voice being carried by the AIDS-infested asshole of Steve Jobs. Ladies and gentlemen, the iPhone 16 is what allows you to be hearing me. It's a pink iPhone 16. It doesn't get gayer than this. It doesn't get more AIDS-infested than this. How are you doing, people, on the Twitter space? We will be talking about Joker 2. I went to see Joker 2 today. Um... And by the way, for those who have not followed the previous spaces, I, uh, I will be on spaces only for at least uh, seven days. And, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm starting to enjoy it. So perhaps we will have a full-blown uh, Twitter space on a regular basis. Maybe I could do three days a week of this. I love speaking to people. I love the fact that the audience shows up and sometimes we hear from Joel Davis. And I heard that Andrew Wilson and Richard Spencer may have, uh, have applied to be a speaker, but I wasn't seeing it. But now I'm on iPhone 16. So if, it, if I don't see it on iPhone 16, then there's really a bug with Twitter space. It will get better with time, but perhaps we can get back to being some sort of a social... Uh, node for the right wing. Uh, so let's talk about it. The Joker 2, the en this is a case where the entire internet is retarded. Too bad. Uh, it's, it's rare that the retardation is so unanimous. But this movie was declared the worst movie ever, possibly. There were people saying this on social media. And this is not what I've seen. I've not seen a movie as good as Joker 1. But this is definitely a good movie. It's, it's really not bad. And so stop being retarded. Analyze correctly. And we will be doing mostly an analysis of the moral axis proposed in Joker 2. And I will show you that this, this is not at all what people have been... Uh, Reporting. Now we have a report from NetSuck saying audio is way better on iPhone. You're going to need to go gay. Uh, you know, NetSuck, no surprise that this comment comes from NetSuck, who is the one member in our audience who washes his asshole with water. I, I'm just going to be direct about it. This guy loves that I'm on an iPhone. This guy gets jets of water, literally. Uh, touching his ass every time he goes to the bathroom. He once came onto an Ask Me Anything and made a defense of the bidet. I mean, he's not even French. How can you be so gay as to have a bidet and not be French? <laughs> this doesn't get gayer than this. Well, anyways, going back to the Joker. What people have been saying is that the Joker is a kind, Joker too is a kind of psyop, that it was meant to lead you to reinterpret the sense of Joker one. Absolutely ridiculous. Joker two is totally in line with Joker one. Now Arthur Fleck happens to be too much of a loser to be able to carry the idea of the Joker, and this is what Joker two is meant to express. Joker 2 is just like Joker 1 was an allegory around humor and social control and authoritarianism. Joker 2 is about the lie of performance. The lie of performance and the fake person that you inevitably become when you become a public person. And it's, it doesn't have to be a lie. There's lots of lying in the movie. But really... When you perform, you are producing... Oh, and by the way, <laughs> there are some people complaining about spoilers. Fuck you. Fuck you, retards. If you can't enjoy a movie while knowing all of it, uh, just disconnect from this space. You are too low IQ. You don't deserve this show. Fuck you. Uh, 
going back, yeah, yeah, so I will spoil the entire movie. I don't give a shit. Because you know what? I could go watch the, the Joker 2 again tonight, having it watched this afternoon, and I would still enjoy it. If you can only enjoy a movie because you're surprised, get the fuck out of my space! So Joker 2 presents the lie of the performance and the role of the female muse in music to inspire and to push a man to become more than he could be. And with the implication that she will drop you if you stop being that man. So Joker 2 is about a conversion of a weak Arthur Fleck who becomes a greater version of himself as the Joker. And he attracts a groupie. Lady Gaga is a groupie, Harley Quinn in this movie. By the way, the best performance of any Harley Quinn ever, cartoon or written form included, or movies, this is the best. Margot Robbie has nothing. She, Margot Robbie has aesthetics. Oh yeah, Margot Robbie is sexy, so you put a couple of lipstick and a little bit of blue and red dye on the face, and okay, you got the suicide girl aesthetic. But Margot Robbie doesn't have a script. Margot Robbie probably costs too much, so you can't invest on the scripts, and she ends up saying only stupid stuff. Now, uh, Lady Gaga, very impressive performance. I would have adjusted the autism a little higher. I think that she was too flowy in her movement. She should have been psychiatrically retarded a little more. Uh, I would have put a high-level artist rather than, you know, she, she's kind of too artistic and it's too professional the way sometimes she... But, but you can also see the movie as being in her delusion. And, and since it's so much in the delusion of the Joker, Arthur Fleck, you can accept that, okay, her flowy movement uh, maybe were just imagined. I would have put... Because... Uh, she performs in clothing, in like social welfare, downtown city level, low level clothing. Like really the clothing that you get when you're in a psychiatric hospital. That's beautiful to see. <clears throat> so, what is the story of the Joker 2? Let's go through the narrative first and then how do we interpret the moral sense of Joker 2? Joker 2 is about Arthur Fleck, he's in jail because he killed five people in Joker 1. He killed, of course, six, including his mother. Um, he killed one of them on live TV, uh, Murray. And so he's in jail, and he's in, in a kind of jail that hosts uh, very high, highly dangerous criminals. And there's some kind of other jail, not so far, where there's church singing and kind of... Uh, the, the music, by the way, of this movie is very good. It's the boom, boom, boom that you had in the Joker 1. Plus jazz, plus blues, plus... Uh, plus, my fucking God, ne me quitte pas. Ne me quitte pas. Ne me quitte pas. Ne me quitte pas. Je serai l'ombre de ta main. I will be the shadow of your hand. I will. Je suis l'ombre de ton chien. I will be the shadow of your dogs. Ne me quitte pas, ne me quitte pas, ne me quitte pas. A, a French song that they made an English version. I, I've never heard an English version of Ne me quitte pas. They made it for the movie, I guess, or maybe they, they took a cover that was done. The music is great. And. It's super intermingled. You have uh, highs and lows and joy mixed with sadness. You have the vroom, vroom, vroom that sometimes comes into a highly joyful song. It is the perfect musical illustration that I was expecting because uh, Todd Phillips, I, I believe that's his name, the director, he gave us in Joker 1 the perfect layout of the epistemological structure of comedy and humor. And in this, he gives us the per layout of music and emotion. Now, it's less interesting. It's a less interesting subject. And 
Therefore, it was a more challenging movie to make. It was very hard to make this movie because, you know, making a musical comedy fucking sucks. I mean, it's cringe. Have you ever seen John Travolta saying, you better shake up, oop, oop, oop. Uh, it is gay as fuck. But he made it okay. He made it okay. And he made it uh, where the emotions, the, the variations of emotion are extremely bipolar, which is exactly what we wanted from Joker 1, from, you know, having this whole contrast between laughter and sadness in the music. Well, we wanted this, but folly at there, it had to be in two. It had to be a, a collective psychosis involving two people. And in that sense, Joker 2 gives us a an absolutely beautiful layout of love and loyalty. And it see, the people on the social media have been criticizing this movie by saying, oh, they're dropping Arthur Fleck under the bus. Okay, but are they, are they giving us another hero that's in line with the moral line of the first movie? Yes, another hero emerge. Harley Quinn... A woman so devoted to her role as a muse to make Arthur Fleck better that when he refuses to become better, she drops him. She tells him his baby that she had inside of her was a lie, basically mentally aborting the baby by saying it was a lie, there's no baby. I, I said it for entertainment. I said it to bring you higher. But now you refuse to be higher, therefore you are an incel. And you get dropped by the criminals on the street. You get dropped by everyone. In fact, you get dropped by a random parasite who eventually will take on the role of the Joker at the very end and kill. Kill Arthur Fleck. So the interpretation of the internet to this was, oh, well, <laughs> they wanted him to be fucked in the ass, raped in the ass by guards, and then die. They want to kill our hero. Well, you have to kill your hero when your hero doesn't stand to the moral principle for which you admired him. And so we had to kill Arthur Fleck. That is, that is the message of the Joker. But there is a woman out there in Gotham City surviving and continuing her role as a muse in the, the finding of the true Joker. That is perfect to me. I, I don't take issue with this. So Arthur Fleck is in this psychiatric place that's for a uh, high danger prisoner. He ends up falling in love with this woman who hangs out at the uh, at the psychi at the lower security psychiatry place of the prison. Where okay, she's insane. She says, "When I saw you kill Murray in the first movie or on TV for her, when I saw you kill Murray." I had been thinking minutes before you did it. Someone should take a gun and put a bullet in his head. So she's giving him the feeling that he has accomplished something, something that a female wanted. And Lady Gaga plays the low-level psychiatri psychiatric female very well. In fact, so well that she plays it uh, in front of Arthur and eventually fools Arthur. We will later learn in the movie that she was in the she was voluntarily at this singing place. She wasn't even a true crazy that was forced there. She wasn't neither a criminal, and her criminal history of putting stuff on fire isn't even true. So we learn that she comes from a rich family and a doctor father, and it's not true that she's been abandoned. But this phenomenon of people coming from high class but presenting themselves as low class is something we see in the world. And we see lots of women do this. It's very interesting. They, they kind of want to live a life of higher trouble than the one that they've been gifted. And that's the case for Harley Quinn. She, she feels comfortable being a hardcore street person, criminal, acting like such. But in the end, she intentionally entered this psychiatric ward to sing and to charm uh, Arthur Fleck because he was a hero to her. And it's never said explicitly, but the way we understand her motivation is she's basically a groupie 
and a muse. The, the true role of the muse in classical writing is the inspiration of the hero. So she is truly a devoted muse. So devoted that she doesn't hesitate to drop under the bus her hero once he's not good enough. So by having sex with Arthur Fleck, she will first she will present herself as this person of the street, bad bad childhood, so that she can identify so that Arthur Fleck can identify with her. She will uh, eventually charm him into thinking and singing, and there's lots of combined psychosis experience in this movie of the two imagining themselves singing, imagining themselves doing things, or perhaps it's reality, just like in Joker 1, there's uncertainty around this. But she will eventually push him to re-become the Joker through his trial. So basically, the big move of this movie that she does as a muse is to, by telling him that she has a child, Arthur Fleck doesn't give a shit anymore, and he becomes bolder, and he fires his own liar, and it's a, it's kind of a courtroom movie. Uh, not fully courtroom, but almost uh, you know, the most important action is courtroom. <coughs> he will fire his liar and start dressing as the Joker. Amazingly, the, the original idea of his liar was to make the case that his brain was fragmented into two parts and that therefore he wasn't guilty of the murder because there's a Joker inside of him that he built in response to childhood abuse and that this other person is not him and that there's a good Arthur Fleck who doesn't deserve punishment. And amazingly, uh, as he fires his liar, he continues this strategy. And he goes in front of the jury and starts speaking with an English accent. And it's very funny. I, it made me laugh that basically he's continuing this idea that he's two people. And when the dwarf guy comes to the stand, he really creates... This is perhaps one of the scenes in any movie that is the most advanced psychological manipulation scene I've seen in my life. He creates this effect where the, the, small, the, the man of small size uh, becomes absolutely terrified because he sees two Arthur Fleck. There's the Arthur Fleck that talks with his little shy voice, you know, the, the little kid of his, uh, of his weird mom. And then there's the Arthur Fleck, the, the Joker, basically speaking with an English accent for some reason. And as he's saying these things in these two accents, he's pulling emo emotions from the guy and also building this whole bi-personality type of defense. It was beautiful. And it's beautiful how he lays out his defense as basically nothing other than the fact that in, in his very speech and in his very interrogation he has shown that he had two personalities now to me the question of whether he has two personalities is a secondary question it's not the main theme of the movie but the main theme of the movie is how Harley Quinn pushed him to be that bold guy now we have an ending that is uh, kind of heartbreaking but at the very end, he dresses as the Joker, goes to do his concluding remarks in front of the jury, and he fails. He's not the Joker anymore. He doesn't talk with the English accent. He's not entertaining. He says, I'm just Arthur Fleck, and th this was all a fantasy. This was all a lie, and I'm sorry I lied. I just killed six people. So the jury finds him guilty. But that is a that is a betrayal. He has just betrayed the code of honor of the criminal muse of Harley Quinn, who wanted him to be bold. She had other plans. She wanted to blow off also the side of the wall of the court, which she will do. I mean, I don't know. The, the movie doesn't say it's her who has blown it up, but certainly someone blew up the, the wall of the court. So... All we needed really was a spectacular demonstration by Arthur Fleck that he is the Joker. She wanted him to be up for that role. But by, de by denying himself and by saying this was all a lie, he has not subscribed to the hero 
to, he has not lived up to the hero that Harley Quinn was seeing in him. And because he failed, Harley Quinn leaves the courtroom and is completely detached. Now, you can call her an evil bitch, or you can say, oh, she lied about having a baby. But the fact is that her lies were all determined in the moral direction of improving Arthur Fleck, of showing him that he could be the Joker. Now, whether he... So, so basically, that's the separation between him and Harley Quinn. That, that's where she leaves the courtroom. And then, poof! The walls of the courthouse are blown up. Everyone is dead. That scene is advanced filming, advanced filmography. It's a sequence scene from Arthur Fleck in the courtroom, followed by camera, dust over them, broken rocks over them. People are dead. He's limping. He's walking slowly. And the music is bah, 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 exactly what's needed. And he gets out, and there are other jokers on the streets, the people presumably who were involved in the blowing up, or, or maybe others. <clears throat> but there's enough criminals out there to rescue him and to basically make him run out of the courtroom, realizing the original Harley Quinn vision, who she had said, he will walk out of here freely. Because throughout this time, Harley Quinn is liberated in, in the Gotham City and is making a case that he's a good guy and he's going to be freed. He's going to walk free from the courtroom. <clears throat> so basically, Arthur Fleck flees with this criminal, but he, he has already denied being the Joker. He has denied his role as a hero. He has abandoned the hero that... Harley Quinn wanted him to be. And so he throws himself out of the very car that's there to help him escape the police and the, judici the, the justice system. So by throwing, him, by throwing himself out of this car, he exposes himself again to arrest. So it's basically an Arthur Fleck who doesn't stand up to the role that people wanted him to play. And he ends up, before he gets arrested, he ends up having a discussion with Harley Quinn because she's waiting at the place that they were both referring to, the, the, the high stairway, you know. So they meet on this stairway and he's like, oh yeah, I'm free now. I can finally come with you. We have a baby, a mountain that we build together, as they mentioned in a previous song. But Harley Quinn is completely uh, emotionless. She doesn't love him anymore. And she says, I told you, uh, she says in singing, uh, the, the lie I told you about the baby was just for entertainment. Now, I don't think we should interpret it as just for entertainment. I think she's saying that. But the reality is she was bringing him, calling him toward a higher calling, now, of course, in Joker, the moral sense of the universe is inverted. So a higher calling is being more criminal, is being more careless, is being more liberated, even if you killed six people. But from her perspective, it was a higher calling for him to assume his role as the Joker and get away from justice. But she's not interested in Arthur Fleck. The good, the good message of Joker 2 folie à deux, which means, by the way, uh, to craziness in a duo, du a duo of craziness. <clears throat> the message is you as a man uh, may get a woman pregnant. She may be out there continuing your line of descent, even if you get in trouble with the law. That is good. But that woman is interested in the greatest version of you. She's not interested in the loser, Arthur Fleck. Arthur Fleck is no one. It's nothing if he's not the Joker. And heartbroken Arthur Fleck learns that Harley Quinn doesn't give a shit about him anymore. The minute he abandoned the fantasy of the Joker, she, Harley Quinn t tells him, that's all we had. Our dual psychosis was all we had, and you shit on it. And so he's desperate and gets arrested by the police. Arthur Fleck ends up in jail, and uh, as someone comes to visit him, he ends up in a hall, and 
there's someone else wanting, wanting, him, wanting to tell him a joke. And he's like, do you want to, me to tell you a joke, Arthur? I can make it quick. And he basically repeats the joke of Arthur uh, to Murray, but he makes a version of it that's fit for the Joker. And he said, you get what you fucking deserve. And he kills him by multiple knife hits in the stomach. Now, the movie doesn't commit to Arthur Fleck being dead, so you could very well have a Joker 3 with uh, a, a Arthur Fleck surviving from his injuries, but people have been complaining, have been, you know, totally alarmed at this ending, saying, they killed our hero. We identified with Arthur Fleck. <coughs> um, look, you shouldn't identify with Arthur Fleck. That was not the guy. <laughs> <laughs> that was not the goal of the first movie. Of course, he was a not that it, he was a, an interesting character, but you shouldn't want to be Arthur Fleck. Arthur Fleck has always been a loser. Arthur Fleck dates. Uh, I mean, he's even deluded about the black woman that he dates. That that's how low Arthur Fleck is. So to me, it's never been a question of identifying as Arthur Fleck. What the movie says is, and very interestingly, at the very end of the movie, the guy who kills him starts laughing. And as he puts his back on the wall, he starts opening his lips to have the smile of the Joker. And he previously referred to himself as a psychopath. So here you have someone who is cutting his, uh, his lips in the Joker way, and he, his laugh starts mixing up with the flowing blood in his mouth. So it's like, <laughs> <laughs> and here you you have the whole story, which is that if you can't elevate yourself to the best that people want to see in you a parasite will come and will replace you. The Joker has been replaced. The, the idea of the Joker is an idea that stemmed in Arthur Fleck's mind, but it is not owned by Arthur Fleck. In many ways, Harley Quinn, in, his, in her crazy vision and her psychosis, she had a better Joker in mind than Arthur Fleck could be. And therefore, Arthur Fleck had to be killed and a new Joker would rise because ultimately your, your memes, if they are good, survive your line of descent if you couldn't stand up to their height. If you, couldn't, if you can't be at the height of the culture you produce, your culture will be absorbed by Parasite. This is the message of Joker 2. I cannot believe that people would say this is the worst movie ever. This is not the best movie ever, but it's a top uh, it's a top 20 easily. Easily top 20 movie. Certainly the best movie since Joker 1. Nothing good has come since. So anyways, that's what I had to say about Joker 2. I might make it a short show tonight because I have some uh, reconstruction of my studio set up to do. But if any of you wants to speak and wants to share views or differs or wants to change my mind, that would be a good moment to open up the mics. What I would certainly want to know is how did you experience the show tonight? Was it better on iPhone? Because today I, I, I had a puzzle of devices to uh, test. I actually went and I wanted to buy an iPhone. But everywhere, they only sell you iPhone if you take a contract. And I was like, I don't want any contract. I don't want to speak on iPhone to my loved ones. I just want uh, the iPhone for the show. I ended up buying an iPad. I set up the whole iPad. And I find out that iPad is not yet enabled. The, it has Twitter, but it doesn't have Twitter space. Can you believe this? Fucking Elon Musk, not programming Twitter spaces onto, uh, onto the iPad. Anyways, so if any of you wants to join as a speaker, I'd like to hear, and certainly I'd like to hear feedback. How's my voice on the iPhone 16? 
Uh, for now, I'm actually doing this show from the iPhone 16 of my girlfriend. So my girlfriend has uh, donated this iPhone for the time of this show. Uh, I see DK Shadow, I see old friends like Max Joseph in the Twitter space. I see Howard, I see Spooky making thumbs up. Thank you so much for the good words. And by the way, what, <coughs> as long as I'm uh, as long as I'm only doing my streams uh, on on Twitter space, I'm not able to lay out all of my donation links. But if you enjoy my analysis, go check out some of my Odyssey videos on video.jfg.world or go to jfg.world if you want to donate to the show. Now, I saw that someone was raising his hand. I have to figure out on this new interface, how do I read people's comments on your audio is better now, though it might not be necessary to buy an Apple device, a light OS. Yeah, I mean, I kind of went uh, all out because I, I know that I've been knowing for a long time that um, I so, somehow just Elon didn't do the, the proper work to to have good audio on Android or desktop. And so the best way that people know how to get good audio on a space is to get an iPhone. I'm sure technically it's entirely possible to get good audio on all the other devices. But unfortunately, Elon, uh, Elon sucks. And sometimes that's just it. By the way, uh, Keith Woods is in the Twitter space right now. And one of the big news of today is that Keith Woods has lost his YouTube channel. He has been banned for hate speech. So that's a very sad, very sad uh, thing that we've learned today. Of course, I've personally moved on from YouTube. I think that we must encourage other systems. And knowing Keith Woods' talents, I'm sure it will be. Uh, he will be bringing his talent elsewhere. And actually, we, we have to just attract people away from YouTube. That's what I've been doing for a couple of years now. Uh, Adam Wiggers is, Adam mm -hmm. Minguez is joining us right now on the speaker line. How are you doing, Adam? Doing good. I missed most of the show. Did you address, I love the movie, by the way. Oh, yeah. Um, did you address anything about like the musical aspect of the movie? Because I, think I didn't comment much uh, other than, yeah, it, it's it's fascinating music. It's mm -hmm. fascinating intersection of cinematography and music. Uh, it's fascinating to be in 2024 and have a musical comedy, basically. Musical <laughs> comedy, not true reality. So, so how do you handle the cringe of a musical comedy? You know that that's actually yeah. a big problem. Uh, wh how it's handled in Joker too? It's that it's musical comedy through psychosis, and it's an interesting mm -hmm. take. I don't know that it's ever been done. Uh, the uh, intersection between the bomb, bomb trumpet style, very deep boat ship noise is beautiful with the joyful blues jazz and it gives us an insight into the emotional state that's how you expect an art or flick to think and view the world so fascinating music yeah it's to me it's it also has a lot of self references to music goals in general in the movie like arthur is a fan of musicals the the guards are fans of music you know, yes. Lady, Lady Gaga is doing this musical thing. It's almost like um, it's a satire of musicals. It's almost it's like a musical of the modern. Uh, it's a modern musical that that actually lands like un, unlike a modern musical like La La Land. Yes. Where this this one has a low discordant tune at, at in every musical number. There's just like this odd background noise and it's sort of reminding you that like no this this fantasy is uh is gonna collapse very quickly well you'll want to to listen to the rest of my show because i've been saying the main theme of joker 2 is the muse 
the muse, the female inspirer of poets. And this is what Todd Phillips is telling us. In the first movie, he was telling you, my main theme is laughter and the relativeness of laughter. His main theme in Joker 2 is the, the duty of the muse. And the duty of the muse is to stand more by the public hero than even the, the person who embodies it. And, and here we see her being more loyal to Joker, basically, than Arthur Fleck. I thought it was very interesting that a lot of this movie could be seen like, uh, there's a lot of Breaking Bad parallels, especially a Saul Goodman series. I don't know if you saw that one. I didn't see it. But very similar ending where there's a moment in the courtroom, same, same courtroom shot, where Saul Goodman is this, you know, suited up uh, defense lawyer who can charm anybody but it comes down to he has he has the game in his hand he can he can saw goodman his way out of it in the in the courtroom but he finally decides to give it all up he says i'm not saul goodman my real name is this i did do all these things you know let justice yeah. be done to me and okay he has the he has like a same muse type woman in the background Very interesting. Well, uh, Todd Phillips has been doing this, you know, taking whole chunks of previous movies. That's mm -hmm. what he was doing with Murray and the 70s type TV shows, which was inspired by what's this movie with, uh, with the same actor. I don't remember the title of the movie, but the whole idea of a network uh, analyst. So yeah, Todd Phillips takes these chunks, but he does something beautiful with it. It is also very interesting how much at one Harley Quinn is, she almost is the Joker. Yes. Like as soon as she takes her eyes off of Arthur, like Joker is no longer with him. Absolutely. Which is why the duty of the muse is ultimately more important than even, even the carrier, the person who is the hero, the group. Uh, you know, I've list, I've watched a, movie called Almost Famous with My Girlfriend, an amazing movie, uh, one of the movies that I really didn't know about. And she comes, she comes to me with it, and it was really fascinating. Uh, Almost Famous is also about the duty of the muse, uh, basically showing that these guys who are doing the rock and roll, They are, they are even less the source of their talent than... Uh, they are replaceable. The muse is irreplaceable. Uh, Penny Fleck in Almost Famous is irreplaceable. And Joker 2 is the Almost Famous of uh, the Joker series. Uh, thank you, Adam, thank for you. your thoughts. It was really great. All right, uh, Joe Wan, uh, do you have uh, something to add tonight? I don't know if Joe Wan will be able to unmute himself, but anyways, we are headed toward the end of the show. I've also tried to invite Rob Ali, but Rob Ali Day, but he has uh, it's been showing up as connecting, connecting. Let's see if I remove him as a speaker and then re-invite him. But anyways, if you can uh, unmute yourself, Joe Wan, we're ready to listen to you, or Rob Ali Day, if you can figure it out. Other than this. Uh, that's it for tonight, and if you want to keep supporting the show, I, I know that it's shorter shows these days and I have less illustrative capabilities, but we'll be back to being able to illustrate video uh, very soon, and we'll keep going with this whole uh, Twitter space thing. Now joining us, uh, there was someone I just clicked on, uh, I don't know if we can hear him. <laughs> okay, th this platform is still confusing to me. I've not yet fully understood the iPhone uh, setup and the Twitter space clicking. So anyways, we'll put an end to this because I had invited another speaker, but he disappeared. Uh, much love, everyone, and I'll be back. Uh, I don't know if I'll be back tomorrow, but I'll be back. Much love, bye-bye, and sleep well.